Welcome to the Rafe Granger Podcast. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you back to the Rafe Granger Podcast. I have Zach Saunders with me today. Hello, Zach. Hello, Rafe. And uh, today's topic we're going to talk about is the concept of fun. And the concept I've often had is Zach and I were talking about this. And so if you want to hear like the pre-show ramble and other nonsense, um, plug on into the Patreon. And by the way, a little quick shout out for the Patreon. So I've created a Patreon page for the Rafe Granger podcast. What's Patreon, you ask? Patreon's just a, a web page. You can go to patreon.com. You'll see other, um, you'll see game owners, you'll see, uh, you'll see uh, game designers, you'll see musicians, you'll see poets, you'll see people building a, um, a big marble thing in their backyard and you can fund basically artistic and creative activity. So if you want to fund the Rafe Granger show and hear um, extra outtakes and, and uh, also that's where the video lies, just go to patreon.com, look for it, the Rafe Granger podcast, and then you can click for various pledge levels and everything you click on is, is thanked and helps pay for the costs of the podcast. So anyway, um, <clears throat> Zach and I were just discussing I have this concept of like, do we as human beings, is it an innate thing to us to have fun? And the premise of that is I remember learning in anthropology that humans will dance. Like it's part of being human that dancing is a, just a, a like it's not dance for fun. It's not dance for release. It's, it can have all those effects. But human beings, like when they study humans throughout the globe, one thing they have in common is dance. And I wondered, does fun fall into that and all the different things we do for fun? Zach had an interesting thing he was talking about with wolves. Tell us about that. So I was just saying, like, I, I think when you think about the concept of fun kind of at its most basic level, f fun essentially is... I think, to some degree at least, a thing that you do to fill the extra time. And what I was saying was, <clears throat> you know, like if you watch, you know, any of the documentaries and whatnot, wolves don't spend a lot of time playing. They do periodically, and puppies do, or pups do a lot. But wolves, in like the hierarchy of like adult society, wolves, you know, they're they're hunting or they're resting or they're doing whatever else, and they don't spend a lot of time playing. Versus my dog spends a tremendous amount of time playing compared to a wild animal <clears throat> and i was saying you know if you sort of take that idea and you look at like those uh those shows like you know uh, uh life below zero or the last alaskans or even like survivor bear grills man. or survivor man those sort of things exactly um you know while they're while they're doing this this survival thing or while they're you know homesteading they don't spend a ton of time having fun because their time is occupied staying alive and I think fun is more a byproduct of people, but I think kind of like a living creature's endeavor to fill the time. Um, you know, it's funny mm -hmm. if you watch, um, I was watching, um, oh, what's the one? It's not, um, it's not Planet Earth because that was Sigourney Weaver, but it's uh, like Blue Planet. It's got the, the British narrator whose name I can never remember. But there was this really interesting thing where they were talking about like the, like the oceans. They were saying like in the wide open sections of the ocean, you know, they don't, see dolphins playing as often as they do like in the shallows where food is plentiful because they don't need to devote as much of their time to acquiring food because it's very plentiful. And I think you start seeing that a little bit with, you know, if you look at like nomadic tribes, you know, they're moving place to place trying to find food and you don't see them spending as much time on like leisure activities as you do like farming communities. And that's maybe a little anecdotal, but I think kind of proves the point. Yeah, I mean, I think about it a lot. I want to. I just want to state that I do think fun is a uh, innate thing that a human being should do. That it's not fun for learning. It's not fun for exercise. Like the the health mm -hmm. benefits to exercise. Yes, exercise mm -hmm. is fun. But what I'm saying is just like eating, breathing, procreating, surviving, dance. Apparently, according to anthropologists that I remember in college fun is on that list. And it's just my own belief. I've not researched this to see if this is true. And I think what we often see when we look at animals is we'll say, oh, that puppy is playing because that's how they learn. So they're learning to hunt or the little cat tracks the mouse or, 
And I think that could be true. And I think that's just human beings. Uh, I never can say this right, Zach. Anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, when you, um, yeah, when you give human characteristics to an animal or creature, uh, well, anthropomorphizing. Yes. And so there you go. I wonder if we're just doing that, and instead, oh look, Reed, Reed is entering. Hey, welcome, Reed. Hold on, he's not here yet. Well, I, I think though, to your point though, I, I think I think you might, Brad. I think there's a certain amount of I think like projection of our own thoughts and whatnot on it. Like, hello, Reed. You know, like, All right, hold that thought, Zach. Oh, I'm holding. All right, so we're in the middle of discussing fun. I'd like to welcome Reed Butler, and Zach meet Reed. Reed meet Zach. Nice to meet you, Reed. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and uh, All right, wait. I decided to have Reed crash our podcast party because I, and Zach, I want to. They're so it. boring without him. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's exactly oh. what he said. And Zach, I was waiting for Reed to, to appear for this show or the next because two reasons. I'm having a bit of a crisis of identity on over what should the show be about, first of all. Uh, like, I'm all over the place for the show. I want to talk about Batman one day. I want to talk about networking tips the other day. Reed and I used to talk about business fails. You know, like everybody talks about their successes. We talked about our failures. Um, mm -hmm. And then I have the show with Zach and I talk about things. And I have the show with Reed and I'm like, you know what? Like Reese's peanut butter cups. I'm gonna blend chocolate with peanut butter, make a Reese's peanut butter cup. Let's do it. I get <laughs> so that's, chocolate. The, that's the premise. So Reed, what we were talking about is I have this belief that fun is essential to the human condition. So we eat, we procreate, we try to survive, we dance. That's that's a common human trait, by the way. And uh, fun is in there. That it's not fun for learning, not fun for play, not fun for, well, fun for play, yes, not fun for exercise. You can have fun doing exercise, but it's innate to being human, and Zach and I were just bandying that back and forth. Okay. So, Zach, continue, if you remember. Um, what was I talking about? I can't remember. We were talking about wolves, we were talking about dolphins, we were talking about food being. Oh, yeah, Zach posited the what he's seen is that and I kind of like this actually. That so wolves apparently don't play that much when you observe them, and dolphins will not play that much out in the open ocean, but they will when the shallows because they theorize food's more abundant, so they're sort of less into surviving and they have time to play. And well, then dolphins I, do some other messed up things too. Yes, dolphins also do messed up things. Yes. Did you hear about the woman who <clears throat> lived with a dolphin and, and essentially was married to it, like including? I was trying to make this PG, you know, in case kids are in the car, but including relations. And it was like this scientific study. And she, she did this. She lived with I got it. got about like, 78 questions. I was going to say, I, I've got at least 78 questions. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I'll try, the, try the, to remember. <laughs> the mechanics of that alone, yeah. I think, are enough to turn me off from the conversation. Yeah. But I'm somehow weirdly curious. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, dolphins, if, you do things correctly and position things properly. It's going to be a very weird podcasting niche if you start going down. <laughs> dolphin love. Yeah. It failed. Yeah. The experiment failed. So they were trying to see, could there be a human dolphin bond? And weird. there was not. It seemed to be the dolphin was like clueless. What, what, what is it with like, have you ever noticed like there's, there's this like weird tendril through like these strange recesses of pop culture about it seems like no matter where we are in our process of evolving or growing as human beings there seems to be this like ever-present subsect of people that is trying to create some sort of human something hybrid you know like mm -hmm. in what was it world war ii the the i can't remember it was the russians and the nazis they were trying to breed gorillas and women to try to create like super soldiers and then you've got this lady who's trying to like dolphin kate which is like well, she wasn't trying to create dolphin. a breed it was like the scientist who was studying dolphins had this idea she was like his student or something i can't even remember where i read this this was back in like the 60s okay this wasn't last year and uh she went through with it and so she, they created this pod where there was the water and then like she lived and like there was a level next to it and then there was this like living room and, and she only interacted with the dolphin and nobody else for like a really long amount of time like if she could create a bond, basically that a bond of love can jump. Uh, Interspecies. 
right like <clears throat> tran- transcend the species boundaries kind well, of well cuz that whole premise of how sort of dolphins are like super intelligent and they save right. swimmers and like they kind of know what's going on and the results if i remember were kind of like the dolphin was like don't care don't care and was like i'm a dolphin get me out of this pod type of activity like did not trying to do that with like tigers all the time and then the tiger just ends up eating them like, same concept yeah yeah and then and then carol baskin ends up on dancing with the stars and apparently the world comes full circle who knows killed her husband so here we are yeah but i think also like i, I think that that's also like a human thing that i don't think necessarily transcends to animals is like I, like i know my dog cares about me. like I, I i i truly believe my dog cares about me. i do too but i don't i don't that think your any does. level Mind. right Right. I don't think your dog cares about you at all. But, My dog but, but I think like trying to elevate that beyond like the affection level, I think is where like that becomes like a weirdly uniquely kind of human pseudoscience experiment. You know, like I, it's not, it's because again, it's not lost on me that like if I died tomorrow and my wife remarried, my dog would probably love that new guy just as much because he's still going to scratch her belly, bring her out to pee and give her food and treats. I mean, it's just, yeah, there's a cap. Yes. You know, that's another fascinating thing I think about too is would your dog miss you? Would he know you're gone? I think recognizing you're gone and missing you are two different elements to that. I, Cause you see the videos all the time of like people that come home from being on deployment for 12 months and the dog goes crazy. And there are times where like, you know, I would, I would go away for a week or so with my wife on vacation. When we came home, the dog wouldn't leave my side for weeks and I think the question there is, did they miss me or did they notice I was gone and that absence of me being there negatively impacted their life in some substantial enough way that they wanted to make sure that didn't happen again? Yeah. Reed, what do you think? Um, I think I think I agree with that. I think there's also an element of us wanting to convince ourselves how much our dog misses us. So we overplay the dog's reaction uh, to make it seem like the dog is super, uh, you know, in love or, or has some great affection towards us. If I passed away and my wife remarried and that guy started feeding my dogs, like I've got no question that they long forget about me. Well, that's, um, that's almost the quintessential debate. I love how we're, I, by the way, anybody just tuning into this kind of podcast um, for your first time, this is how they go. So they're going to bounce all over the place. It's what Zach likes. It's what Reed likes. It's what I like. So if you don't like it, this, ain't, this is not the podcast for you. This, this seems to me, though, the quintessential debate about cats versus dogs, that a dog is like, love who you with kind of guy. Like, yeah, I got the steak. But I'm wondering, yeah, like, I don't know. I wonder if they, because they, we know that they can, communicate they communicate right my dog lets me know when he has to go out we know that they seem to know what's going on with our world you know like like again zach's gone he comes back that's now whether that's oh that smell hasn't been here for a while and now that smell is back maybe that gets them excited i don't know but they do seem to and they've lived with us for what twenty five thousand years or something like that have you heard about that how dogs have been part of the human existence yeah, and it's it's funny because like that that's a whole other thing that's like really interesting is uh, like like this is something that might so you know like you know like when you're sitting down with your buddies and you have a couple of cigars and a few glasses of scotch and the next thing you know you're talking about things that you have no intellectual prowess to be able to even talk about. We talk about this all the time about like the the evolution of domestication and how some animals like some animals are easier to domesticate and some animals like specifically dogs is what we were talking about like. That, that creates this whole other sort of interesting kind of like narrative because you figure like if you're a cow and you're a, a wild cow, as crazy as that sounds now, because you're, you're a wild cow out in a field and this guy comes over and he gives you something yummy to eat and you follow him back and he closes the gate behind you and now you're in a pasture eating the same grass you were eating, doing the same thing you're eating. And now you get milked every morning and every once in a while one of your friends goes missing and then there's steaks on the grill. Like that's not a big leap to understand why that was domesticated. But like with dogs, it was, you know, we're in tents and these terrifying pack hunters are coming through and raiding villages and killing off small animals and carrying away chickens or whatever else. And then one day, one of those dogs was a little less aggressive and let him get a little closer. 
And then the next day he brought a friend. And then over the course of several generations, those slightly less aggressive, slightly more friendly, slightly more trusting dogs became pets. Like, like that, that, that's two wild ends of that spectrum that are like so interesting to think about. Like who was the first guy that like walked into his hut and was like, honey, check out this. We're going to call him Fido. Why? I don't know, but he's a dog now. Okay, great. Did he kill like three kids yesterday? Yeah, but today he's our pet. Okay, well, great. Let's go. <laughs> I want to hear from Reed after this. First of all, what we're doing is this wonderful thing called the Armchair Expert, uh, which I didn't coin. That's a podcast with Dax Shepard and Monica Padman. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you haven't heard that podcast, you got to listen to that podcast. I'm a huge fan. But yeah, that that's his whole premise is he just knows all this kind of random stuff, which the three of us know too. By the way, Dax Shepard's a, a bucket list item. I, I want him on our podcast. So so put that out to the universe. But I've, I've read a little bit about this because I've been fascinated by it. It used to be the thought of what you said. There was the wolf and the thing and he was rough and you'd kill the sheep and then they would domesticate him. There, I think they're now saying that's not the case, that there's a domesticated dog tree that has always been n- more passive, more docile. It would live on the outskirts of the human encampment and not try to kill the sheep or eat the baby. They just sort of lived there. And then what he would do is he would alert, oh, the wolves are here. He would bark, 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 bark. Or danger is here. He would bark, 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 bark. So he wasn't really a threat to begin with. And so slowly, it's almost as if he just got to be a little bit more closer to the campfire. And then, right. and then over time, it became true symbiosis versus the wolf that got tamed. They're actually thinking like, no, that didn't happen because wolves are wolves. Can't tame them now. You know, that kind of thing. Reading. Challenge accepted. <laughs> New news headline: Mortgage loan originator Zach Saunders gets eaten by wolf. No, no way. No <laughs> Reed, way. what do you think? I don't know if I have a whole lot to add. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've got no real. I mean, okay, so yeah, so dolphins, dogs, domestication. I don't know. I think we've maybe gone triple D. Now. Triple D. Diners, drives, and dives. Dogs, dolphins, <laughs> domestication. I love it. This is our new show. Oh, that's going to be the name of the podcast. Triple D. Theories involved on it. All right, triple D. So I want to jump all the way back to the beginning of this and talk about the fun thing again, because I have a question for you. Okay, so you had said fun is a thing that is like naturally intrinsic to the human condition, which I don't my think th- I necessarily disagree with. My theory. But I don't necessarily agree with. That's a, a Rafe Granger exclusive theory. Here's my question for you. What yes. do you think is the catalyst to stop someone from pursuing a fun activity as an occupation versus leaving it as just a fun activity. I and what I mean by that is, okay, so let me, so I, I love cooking. I right. love cooking. I consider it to be probably my favorite outside of coaching rowing, my favorite pastime, hundred hmm. percent. I would never, ever want to be a professional oh. chef. You two talk amongst yourselves. I forgot. I have a contractor here. I've got to go talk to him. Go ahead. Keep going, Zach. Do you think? So I was saying, I would never, ever, ever want to be a professional chef. So, but there are people out there that love cooking and then choose to go into being a chef as their occupation. Like, what do you think is the thing that stops one person from pursuing a passion as an occupation and motivates the other person to pursue it as an occupation? Does it make you nervous to think that you would turn your passion into something uh, I think so. I mean, I, th- I think there's a certain level of nervousness that if it stops being fun and starts being a chore, then I won't like doing it. And so there's like that fear of losing the fun. Well, then also, but, I'm going to add in the potential. Because now what you could do is if you went and became a chef and then you failed at it, now what do we do? How do you go, how do you go back to just enjoying cooking? You then make and it's like that could you ever go home again type of thing like if you loved cooking and then someone told you you stunk at it could you ever go back and really enjoy doing it again can you put that cat back in the bag and have just a passion for cooking i think we should take a break and just talk wild smack about rafe while he's gone just for fun is his contractor i mean it's a good thing he didn't mute us that would have been really inconvenient <laughs> 
Yes. I, you I, yell I them? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I love cooking too. Yeah, I have so thing too for but like a weird cooking okay. trend. Okay. I've always you thought about it. What if I opened up a nice restaurant? Yeah. But what? I also look like, at how much I spend on each one of the other that I'd have to charge 100 bucks a plate all the time. Right. Right. But when I get to pick up the decent meat and then the farmer's market, like, I can never sell this stuff. Right. Right. Like, how would I ever turn a profit cooking the kind of food that I cook? Yeah, making like like a, a pizza that cost me thirty dollars. Right. Right. Which you're now selling for sixty bucks to make a profit, and you're going like, who wants to buy a sixty dollar pizza? Like, yeah. nobody. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, if there's a necessary <laughs> of pleasure, fun, hobby to work. Like, because even like people who are, you know, doing their absolute dream job, like have hobbies outside of that, that they're equally as passionate about, but they never want. Sure. Right. No, that, and that makes sense. It's a really good point. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like my job and I, that's what I do. And I, you know, I don't fall into the category of like, I have a side passion that I'd love to turn into my job. Uh, mm. But there's definitely other things that I'm like, well, I guess if I if I failed at this, I'd maybe give this a try. But I don't know if it then ruins the whole thing, right? Like, because all of a sudden, if you're cooking for 100 people every night, like, is there something that no longer becomes fun anymore? I think, I think for me, I think that's what it is. Like, I think it's the fear. It's not really the fear of someone not enjoying what I made. Because I figure, like, I've made stuff that's been absolute garbage that I enjoy that nobody else liked. Yeah. I think for me, it's more a matter of, you know, if I'm cooking for, like, if I'm cooking for my parents, my in-laws, my wife, my son, my sister, her husband, and then whatever, a couple of cousins or something, and they're over at the house. Like, I enjoy that. Like, I like the social aspect in the kitchen. I like having somebody enjoy something that I've made. There's like a certain validation of a skill set that I find enjoyable. I think right. if I was doing it for the masses, I think it would stop being fun. And maybe this is what you're kind of like getting at is like, if I wanted to make a really good beef stew tonight and then I get stuck late at work and I can't do it and I head home and we just do takeout, like no one's angry that I didn't produce. Right. And maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Just so kind of one of those things. I was... I'm not sure you'd get the, the joy of cooking for your, your in-laws or your parents or your wife. It's like the, the obvious appreciation from them. Right. Yeah, there's a very immediate and obvious reward system. If right. you change that into a, I'm going to own a restaurant and I'm going to be the chef, and you don't hear on a nightly basis or, or whatever it might be, like what fuels you is why you like cooking is because it's the communal aspect of everyone coming together and you enjoying that meal with them, not, right. hey, here's this dish I made, see you later. Like it's more like, the process of cooking is great, but it's sort of that end result that gives you the biggest. And the end result is the community that you share it with, not the actual, like the sole product. So I know I'm jumping in midway, I'm back. Um, so is your question, why aren't you doing what you love as a job? Now, my question was, what do you think is, I think I used the word catalyst, but what do you think yeah, is, what, the, what do you think is the thing that stops one person from pursuing a thing they love as an occupation, whereas it motivates somebody else to take the thing they love and make that their occupation? Two things. What did Reed say? <laughs> uh, I said that you're, you're potentially turning that into something, turning what you thought was fun into something that's no longer uh, basically into a job. Yeah, that was my second thing, is that somehow deep down, we know in our gut that we wouldn't like it as a job. Right. We just, and, right. And, we just yeah. intuit it. Yeah. And then the other reason is fear. Like, you would like it, but people have fear and, and self-doubt. And so they say things like, oh, I could never, I could never be a chef. And that's ridiculous. Well, we talked about that before, Rafe, where like, you know, you see a lot of entrepreneurs have their side passion, have their side product uh, project, but there's a 
they all they ever do there's dip one toe into into it right so they never become they never that side project never becomes a full-time gig because they have they can't fully commit to it right so yeah right so you talk about it a lot like you're like there's a lot of people who are like hey man i'd love to do this for my full-time gig and but i can't leave my my steady job and the answer to making that your full-time gig probably and being successful is to take that leap but that leap is often uh, too, too, too big, too big. Uh, and, yeah. I know for me, I lived it a little bit in that. Also, what's that? Hello. Huh, weird. Uh, for me, I lived it a little bit. Oh, he's got rubber banding. I think Zach's rubber banding. Are you back? Reed, are you I'm rubber back. banding? I'm here. Okay. Um, for me, I lived it um, when I was a kid, 16 years old, I did um, children's magic shows. And uh, like for real, like as a job. And I, on weekend, I'd have two shows Saturday, two shows Sunday, and uh, made pretty good cash. And I began to hate it. I hated doing magic because I would be nervous before the show. I would have to like prep and like it would like in my mind ruin my Friday night because I'm like, oh, I got two shows tomorrow. I got to make sure I'm on. And uh, I began to just not like the job aspect of it, even though I was good at it, had tons of referrals, made lots of money. And so when I went to college, I quit. My mom, my mom was disappointed in me. She's like, you could be doing magic shows for all the professors. And I'm like, I'd rather work at the gas station pumping gas, which is literally what I did than do the magic shows. So for me, I learned that when I turn one of my hobbies into a job, I, I don't like it. I don't know why though. I just know that I don't. Isn't there also part of it that you, you lose, um, you lose a bit of creativity or freedom when you turn it into a job? Yes. Because, like you hear people like, uh, you hear musicians, like, you know, they make an album because they were told it was going to be successful, not because of what they truly wanted to be writing, right? right? You know, they, they made a pop album when they really prefer to make a folk album, whatever it might be. And so, like, if we bring it back to that cooking or even the magician thing, like, you're going to, you know, kids' birthday parties and you're doing the most basic magic, the stuff that you do all the time, and you don't have the freedom to just be like, hey, I like doing this on my own. And I like, you know, challenging myself because now you're just sort of going through the motions. Like, yep. even... You know, even if you're cooking, like you can only, if you, if you're at a restaurant or you're doing it professionally, like you can only get so creative or outside the box. Whereas now when you're just cooking for your family, like if it sucks, you know, Chipotle's uh, five minutes down the road, like we can roll with that. And I'm not out of a job because I don't have a review written that it sucked at it. Yeah. Do you, um, have, have you guys seen the movie Chef, John Favreau? Yeah, really good. Yeah. You seen it, Reed? Yeah. No. So it it anybody who's interested in cooking, I like to cook too. Like you know, it makes you want to either open a small restaurant or get a food truck, right, Zach? Oh yeah, you 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 finish that movie and you're like, I'm gonna throw everything away. I'm gonna sell everything. I'm gonna go buy a panel van and convert it over to a food truck, and I'm gonna take a stab at this. Well, I left that thinking grilled cheese sandwiches. Yeah, grilled cheese. Um, so there's a couple of things in there. One is Sophia Vergara. Is that yeah. her name? She's in the movie and uh, Scarlett, Scarlett Johansson's in the movie. So like John Favreau is kind of connected to both of them romantically. And you're like, well, A, I mean, I'll, I'll, that'll happen. And then also, um, yeah, he makes this like grilled cheese to like, you just go, oh, I got to eat that. And <laughs> Zach will understand this. In the movie, there's a recipe called Scarlett Johansson spaghetti. And because uh, he makes this, there's the romantic scene where he makes this like tossed spaghetti thing. And I'm like, I'm making that. And it was before it was on the internet. I couldn't find the recipe. So I watched what he did and then I made it at home and, and it came out really good, I have to say. Now the recipe exists on the internet. So it's cool though. He studied that, with a it, chef. Reaction from the girl you were courting. Uh, well, it was it was Emmy at the time. And so she, she was like, she didn't necessarily find the um, extra effort involved was worth it. She was like, oh, we can just. she's a huge fan of chef too. We watched that movie at least three times a year. That and um, the other movie we watch is that thing you do. No, oh, yeah, with uh, Tom Hanks, the Tom uh, Hanks, like yeah. the quasi Beatles monkeys. Yeah, that's band the one. thing. Yeah, I yeah. haven't. You know what's so funny is I feel like this is like that Mandela effect for me in my mind. Of I feel again? like 
So Mandela effect is like when something isn't real, but everyone remembers it as real. So like, for example, if I say the actor Sinbad appeared in the movie Sinbad, your brain immediately can visualize what that is. Yeah. And you convince yourself in a microsecond that that was a thing and you just believe it. And they call it the Mandela effect because back in the 80s, there was this reporter who was doing an article on the imprisonment of Nelson Mandela and some like ridiculous number. Like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but call it like, like 40% of the people that he interviewed believed and had vivid memories of Nelson Mandela dying in the 1980s in prison during the apartheid in South Africa. And there's this whole, and I'm, I'm butchering this explanation a little bit, but basically he came up with this idea that like once an idea reaches a certain saturation point, it's just believed to be true. Yeah. Reg regard regardless of its efficacy. So that that's called the Mandela effect. So for me, this is like like one of those things is like when someone says that thing you do, like I truly believe in my mind for a split second every time someone brings that movie up that I've seen it, I enjoyed it, and I remember things about it. But when I really stop and think, the only thing I know is Tom Hanks was in it, and it was about a boy band in the fifties ish. And you can't even remember if you've seen it. Nope. That's no idea. Awesome. You've got to watch it. No idea. <laughs> Read. What are your what's Do you have any movies you watch? Like you just have to watch two, three times a year? No. Hmm. Yeah. No. I mean, oh, there's some definitely movies that I... Yeah, but nothing like... That, nothing oh. that's coming to mind. Oh my gosh. I watch A New Hope two to three times a year. I watch mm -hmm. Chef two to three times a year. I watch That Thing You Do two to three times a year. It helps that my daughter's also interested in those. So she's like, you know, she'll prompt that. Um, see, so I have, I have my movies that I make it a point to watch a couple times a year. And I don't know why it's almost like this weird research phenomenon in my brain of like, I got to stay current on this movie that was made forever ago. No reason why. But then there's also those movies where every time you're channel surfing and you see it, you stop and you watch at least a little bit of it, no matter what else is going on. Yeah. And, and then there's those movies that you remember that you liked and then you watch them and they either don't stand up and you realize you didn't like it to begin with or it's and not the movie you thought it was entirely. That right. that happened to me with, um, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of the name of the movie. The Langoliers with Stephen King. Or the Stephen King book, The Langoliers. Every time that comes on, Never heard of that. I think, oh, it's, it's so it's this, it's this Stephen King novel about um, like as you progress through time, you leave the past behind you as like a physical representation of what had happened. And the Langoliers are these creatures that come and eat the past so that we as humans can't essentially like, I think it's supposed to be like, so we can't time travel. Huh. Um, and the past gets destroyed, which is why your memories are the only connection you have to the past. And so this people end up trapped, they go through this like portal, they end up trapped in the past. And so they're in this airport trying to find a way to escape to get back to the Back to the Future, another great movie that I watch every time it's on. Um, they're trying to get Back to the Future, and the Langoliers show up and start eating things. But it's got Bronson Pinchot in it, who is the cousin Balky from Perfect Strangers, and he's like a total psychopath. And there's just there's some really great moments in that movie. But every time I turn that movie on, I think that it's the Tommy Knockers, <laughs> which is another Stephen King book about these things that live under the stairs. And I always watch it for like ten minutes before I'm like, uh, this is not the movie I thought it was. How can I always Tommy do this? And then I. And then I hate myself for never remembering it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Fun. Intrinsic. So here's how I, here's how I came up with this theory was that I'm often coaching business people and it seems like funds like the last thing they think of having to do for their life. And so I'll often see like exercise comes up often. Like they'll say, I got to exercise more. I have to eat better. I have to exercise more. Then after that, sometimes spiritual, like, like uh, I've got to read the Bible more. I need to um, go to church more. And it's like, I'll never fun. I never hear them say, I oh, mean, I need to have fun more. I need to, whatever their version of fun is. Uh, if it's golf, they'll say golf for sure. Um, and I don't know if golf fits the fun category. I'm not a golfer, Reed. You might be able to weigh in on this. I don't know if gun fits the fun category of life or the exercise category of life. Mm. I would think fun. I think fun. Like people like depending don't say, on who you're doing it with. Yeah. But well, I would say it's probably a large group that think golf is also exercise. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking like when people go, I need to exercise more. They don't mean golf. They mean lift weights, run, row, right? Yeah, away. I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I think that'd be a tough sell from the wife. Be like, hey, I gotta go exercise for four hours on the golf course. Right. Yeah. I, oh, I'm gonna it, use that. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm stealing that. Beers on the way. I'm stealing that. I just I'm think that. the reason yeah. I came to it was I try to include fun in almost every single day. It's as it's as important to me, if not more important to me, than eating and sleeping. Um, how many? How? What's the percentage of time you think you achieve that? Three hours a day. A fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. What? You wow. have fun for three hours a day. Yeah, that's not including daughter time, which is also fun. My wife's going to murder me if she ever hears this podcast, but I'm not sure that I've had legitimate fun for three hours in all of 2020 so far. See? Like, I have, I have moments of, of, of pure, unbridled enjoyment, but I don't know that I've, I've actually had fun fun for three hours in, wow, that's yep. three hours? Yeah. All right, well, hold on. I, I need some quantifying information on this fun sure. because I, I, have, I, have, I have follow-up questions. Yeah, well, um, I, I just find that if I'm not doing something for me that is fun, and trust me, it does cause stress in the marriage for sure, without a doubt. I'm a little bit fortunate in that I'm in marriage number two. And so I sort of had this belief from the get-go. So I, I can play that card to be like, you know what you're married. You know, like it's almost like if I was a golfer and I'm like, look, I golf every Sunday of every summer of every day. Sorry, it's how life is. When your wife buys in, you know, you get to play that card. But um, <clears throat> I started to get up early, Zach, where what was, so what was happening is if I didn't get up early and I got up and my day started at nine, there was no fun. I did not have mm. enough hours in the day to have fun. I had to do my dad duties, my work duties, my life duties, the house mm. duties, and then it's late. You know, then I try to have fun and it's 9 p.m. and then I stay up till midnight and that's not good for me. I can't hack it. So I started right. to get up 5.30 a.m. And I accidentally backed into this. The way I got myself up was I read a book on how to get, get up early and it was like, do a half hour, just do a half hour for two weeks straight. And that ding, 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 the alarm would go off and I'd be like, oh, this is stupid. I don't need to get up. It's 5.30. This is re ridiculous. Like this is me in my head. I'm like, we all know you're not going to roll out of bed and hit your office. This is not going to happen. So I'm like, well, what if you rolled out of bed and played a video game that you've been wanting to play you can't get to? Like one of those 40-hour Xbox games types of games, like The Division or something. So I'm like, that could work. So I got up, made my coffee, played my video game for half an hour from 5.30 to 6. And then um, and then I gave a cutoff, let's say it was 7 a.m. And then I would read and I would putter around. And then next thing I knew, I'm awake and happy at 7 a.m., which is two hours before when it used to be 9 a.m. So that's how I get it in. So now what I do is... Um, I don't get up 5.30 anymore. I get up about six and I would say I get about an hour and a half of fun rave time in the morning by myself. And also, and then at nighttime, I'm a little bit fortunate. My kids are older. This didn't happen when my kids were infants up to eight, but now my right. youngest is 13 and is at the phase where she's just as happy to not be with dad as she is be with dad. And so, yeah. So then I'll get, you know, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. I'll be thinking around uh, playing this new game called Crusader Kings 3 where okay. you play this family. The whole goal is to have your dynasty live. Not land acquisition, not battles, not war. You have war, but if Reed's the neighboring person and he's like getting in my grill, like he'll take a territory, like I can do a plot to have him murdered type of thing or I can murder his kid. Boy, I know this sounds horrible. Like, who wants to play? Like, when I read this, I'm like, how's that fun? This is creepy. No. So I played it one time through, not murdering anybody, not doing anything. But you can, you can click these things to happen. And then I was like, oh, I see how people would do this. And it was more fun than I thought. But, yeah, that sucked up, like, 15 hours of gameplay. Over so you wake week. up early in the morning to murder my kid, and that's fun. Yeah. Yeah, strangely. Mm -hmm. Well, your kid's going to become heir, and that's going to threaten my domain. So... Can't stop that. I can't stop that. Right. No, I actually don't. You're the rightful bloodline. Uh, yes, the bloodline. It's all about Crusader Kings Three. Um, it's a deep I'm one. It down. It's a yeah. deep one. I oh, and that required me to watch at least 15 hours of YouTube videos to figure out how to play the darn game. I am not writing that down. No, that's the read. That is not your cup of tea, <laughs> for sure. No. So along that same line as you were just talking about getting up, so. Uh, 
I've seen this guy speak a couple of times. His name is Tony Giordano. He's a realtor out in uh, Los Angeles. He was on like million dollar listing and a bunch of other stuff, but he, um, <clears throat> yeah, he's, he's, he's a force of nature. The guy's actually pretty impressive. Um, but he actually, the last time he was out here in New Hampshire, uh, it was down in Nashville. He did like a speaking engagement for the Keller Williams office down there. Uh, and I got invited to come along. And one of the things he was talking about was doing an evaluation on when you're your most effective and then changing your day to more align with what you want versus what you need. And it was interesting because he had said, you know, he's, he's a morning person. So his thought process was always get up early, get to the office early, bang out a bunch of work really quick while you're fresh and focused. And then, you know, do the rest of your day. And he had said one of the things that made a big difference in his life was when he flipped the script on that a little bit and made family time first thing in the morning when he was fresh and, you know, cognizant. Because no matter what was going on, he had to get the work stuff done. So if he did that when he was most focused, then when he got home, he was unfocused around his family. And it kind of sounds like you're sort of taking a slightly different version of that, but kind of doing the same idea of that evaluation of when you're, when you are the best you and where the best you needs to be. Well, that's what I found is I accidentally fell into this. I found, I used to go like this, got to get my day job stuff done. I got to get all my stuff done. I got to get my family stuff done so that I can have fun. And then what I was doing is rushing through it all. When I, when I used it as the carrot to get up in the morning, I found that after 90 minutes playing a computer game, I'm like, man, I'm done. Like that's sort of my, I'm like, I got to get up. I got to start moving. I feel satiated. I feel done. And I'm like, it's seven thirty, And then suddenly I'm doing the reading of the business book. I'm doing the journaling. I'm answering a ton of emails and I'm not rushing through it to get to the carrot. It was kind of, I should write that down. It's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. It's kind of like eat your dessert first. That's, uh, that's interesting. Cause yeah. my whole thing has always been get to the office, take care of everything and then get home. But then a lot of times when I get home, I'm like, oh, I'm freaking so exhausted that, you know, let's, let's get the kid to sleep so that I can then, you know, and then I'm too tired to talk to my wife because I'm just like, I just I've talked all day. I just don't want to do this. And then we just sit on the couch and, and watch TV or, right. or read independently as opposed to, yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. I wouldn't have thought about it. Right. I always have, I also have this, uh, I feel guilty if I don't get started on work early enough. Oh, me too. That, that, like that, that guilt, that, that, it's that, that little black rain cloud that follows you around that it's, it's yeah. seven 30 and I haven't done anything yet, or it's eight 30, whatever time that is. And I, yeah. I'm not at this point yet. Oh, I, I battle with that. I get in panic daily. Like, what, how could I have not gotten to work at this point? Like, like, you know, if I didn't, if I will, if I was needed to wake up at five 30 so that I could work out and get to work by, let's say eight, but let's say I woke up at six. If I wake up at six, I go, okay, well, workout's not happening because I can't delay getting to work till eight. Because if I don't get to work till eight, then, you know, the world is going to come crashing down. Uh, I just have this major, like, yes, that, that concept of, of, of making time for your family when you're most present, if that is the morning, that sounds great to me, but I don't, that's going to be hard to break the idea of like, I think so for I can me, help. maybe don't get the opposite. Yeah, I would say. Go ahead, Zach. Well, I, I, I was gonna say, I think, I think for me, the hard part was having the honest conversation with myself that I'm now very comfortable having, which is there's really no such thing as an emergency, and there kind of is, and and this can be situational based on what you do for work, but you know, I, I work in the mortgage industry, and it is deadline driven, it is date driven, it is extremely high stress, and it is. It is every person you deal with is either vacating a house and runs a risk of being homeless, buying a house and has tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line, or they're trying to get out of a bad situation or help their kids, you know, and that's kind of what it is. So that level of stress just gets built on. And the thing that took me a while, and I mean, it, it, it was a battle for me, at least for a long time was it's not really an emergency. If it's eight o'clock or eight 15, or if it's eight o'clock or eight 30, it, it's still going to get done. And Yep. That was the hard part for me in doing that. And once I sort of got comfortable with that idea, um, it, it made the rest of it kind of fall into place. Now, uh, what, now what comes, is there, so for me, for a while, it was like, I can't, I don't have that luxury because I'm not 
you know, where I want to be successful wise. Like once I got to that point, it becomes easy to be like, you know what, this isn't such a firestorm, right? Because all in the back of your head, like if I don't do everything right now, mm. I might lose this client and I can't afford to lose this client. Like you definitely, I don't know, like maybe, maybe it's the wrong way to think about it. And Rafe will probably tell me it's the wrong way to think about it. But like For sure, no. having the financial security side, especially in an industry like yours, like mine, like Rafe's where, you know, we're not, uh, just collecting a W two paycheck every every uh, right. week is that you get you get to the, for me like I get to the point or I got to the point where like I was so sort of concerned about what was going to happen next month and the month after that I actually mm-hmm. found myself just paralyzed. Like it's right, so a, I'm gonna like I'm gonna like, steal. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. No, it's you, you think like it's a motivating factor um that you have to make sure that hey i gotta get all this stuff done because because if i don't then i won't feed my family or whatever you think it's going to be this ultra motivating thing it, for me it caused paralysis mm-hmm. i'm just like i just staring at this huge you know tidal wave coming i'm like oh, I, I literally can't do anything so so two things I'm, I'm gonna steal a quick story here from my friend jason he's a uh, an agent down at kw in nashua he's awesome and he spends a lot of time thinking about this type of thing this is the way he described it to me years ago. And this is something that I think about all the time. So imagine, imagine that you're holding an egg and you have to run from wherever you got that egg all the way back home again. The entire time you're running with that one egg, all you're doing is worrying and thinking about not dropping that egg. It becomes the only thing you're thinking of. And you start missing like, you know, oh, I missed that crack on the sidewalk and I stubbed my toe and I started to trip a little bit, but I was able to save it. And so that could have been a disaster that wasn't because I'm singularly focused. Now imagine you're in that same scenario, but you've got two buckets and you're holding hundreds of eggs and you walk and now you're paying attention to what's going on around you because you don't need a hundred eggs to feed your family. You need one or two. And now you start noticing those cracks in the sidewalk and you miss them. So although you've got a lot more, you're focused on the things that could be hangups and not focusing on protecting the one thing you have. And I think once you start kind of getting yourself into that mentality of, you know, I can only do what I can do here let me focus on what the other problems could be outside of this, but not fixate on the one little egg that I'm afraid to drop. That, that became kind of the catalyst for me. And that I think also, I mean, to your point, you know, the mindset of operating from a place of scarcity versus a place of abundance is a very challenging internal conversation to have of, you know, I need to do everything possible for this one client because if I don't, I don't know when the next one's coming. And, you know, again, that's an exaggerated version of it, but you know, that is a real thing versus, you know, oh, I have 50 clients. If 10 of them tell me to go pound sand and go elsewhere, I still have 40. I'm still good. Right. Try to structure your day and try to structure your mentality going into it around that idea of if I lose one or two, I'm still fine. How do I get myself to the point where I am good losing one or two? And right. that freedom that gets generated allows you to be a much better version of you within the transactions. My, um, <clears throat> it came to memory why I have this whole fun thing. So I think about this a lot, this concept of, of like, why is it, yeah, why, are there, why is there guilt associated with if I'm not at work at 7 a.m.? Like I used to have that too. And I think for me, it stems from some of you, Reed, you may know this, Zach, I'm not sure if you do, but I, I'm being reminded of why fun is a big deal to me. And I think it's because of the interpretation of when my father died. And so when he died, he died in a small plane crash, the pilot, his brother, my father. I'm standing there when a state trooper knocks on the door to tell my mom. The story goes, I was there too. So I heard it from there. I don't remember that event at all. Somehow I think I took away from that. Oh my God, life can end like that, which a lot of people have that instance. And so somehow I then converted that into, I better eat my dessert first, or I better have fun first because I could walk outside and then die. Somehow that's just how I interpreted it. Yeah, I think, I think, I think. 90% 90% of people interpret it like that in the moment and then just revert back to. Yeah, they revert back. And that's why it's similar when you have the cancer, you know, the cancer diagnosis story and they're like, suddenly it's, they start living and it's, it's all that same genre. Yeah. So I think I was wired at an early age to make fun or living to be much more important to me earlier. I was hardwired. So it's an easier decision is what I'm getting at. But then I'm wondering, where does it come from? I blame the Quakers. 
We believe we live in the Northeast. The Quakers are the religion that were the early bird gets the worm and idle hands are the devil's work. And all of those sayings, uh, Ben Franklin, you know, uh, a penny saved is a penny earned. Like all of those sayings are mother society whispering in our ear, whispering in our ear, whispering in our ear that if we're not up early working, we're somehow not a contributor. We're somehow lazy. We're somehow a slacker. And so what I encourage my people to do is you got to go, wait a minute, just because I hear that saying all the time, I don't have to adopt that belief. I think we, I think we just wake up adopting it. You know, our parents told us it, our teachers, whatever. So A, you don't have to adopt it. What was liberating to me that made me, allowed me to break it even more than my father's death's interpretation by me was Timothy Ferris's The 4-Hour Workweek and how he describes in his book how he went to Europe, had a nervous breakdown, went to Europe, could only contact his office for one hour a week without going insane. Did so, his his work did better. His company did better without him. So for some reason, I'm like, gosh, if that guy can work four hours a week and run a million dollar company, I can work 20 or 30 or whatever the hour was. For whatever reason, that book helped me not have that 7 a.m. guilt. But yeah, that's all for, it is. For, I think for me, a big part of it, and this gets back to that like scarcity versus abundance. For me, I think in the beginning, I remember when I was first getting started, it, it, I mean, I was answering phone calls at 1130 on a Sunday night because I felt like I needed to. And it's funny how when I started putting in place time restrictions, and again, not universal, but time restrictions by and large, um, my level of stress went way down and my performance of my clients went way up. And I think a lot of people kind of appreciate that because I, I, I distinctly remember this is in 2007. So like right before the big like meltdown, I had somebody who called me at like 10 o'clock on a Friday because I had set the expectation that if they need me, call me. And he happened to be free at 10 o'clock on a Friday. And I didn't answer the call. And then I got like a hateful text message from him that was like, you said, I if I those. called, you'd answer. Right. You said, you said, if I called, you'd answer. And I just texted him back and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'll give you a call tomorrow morning. And the text I got back was okay. And I realized at that moment, like, oh my God. So I undermined my own credibility by saying I was always available. I set an unrealistic expectation for answering calls on a Friday at 10 PM. I don't want to be doing that. Okay. And I've kind of remedied it here. And then I started saying to customers after that, you know, if you need me, text me. If I can answer, I will. If I can't, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And just that little tiny change for me made a huge difference in my level of stress and started kind of getting away from, you know, that. The other thing too that really helped me a lot was, was BNI. I know this sounds totally cliche, but having a standing meeting on Wednesday mornings meant at least one day of the week at 7 a.m. if you call me, I'm not answering. And then that proved itself as being okay. Because the phone calls that came in at seven, I answered at 9.30. And people were, you know, sometimes a little miffed that it took me two hours to get back to them. Sometimes they didn't care. And that just kind of became a thing. And now that's kind of the way that I, I choose to operate is text me if I can answer. I will. If I can, I won't. If it's truly an emergency, I'll let you know. The end. Yeah, I think we tend to think our clients are going to think these things are bigger problems than they are, right? We create these scenarios in our head yeah, to good point. reason and uh, identical story to what you were just saying is the same thing, right? I would respond immediately, you know, Saturday, Sundays, whatever it was, and then come to find out like clients don't really expect that. And on the other side, like if clients almost for me, take me more as a professional. If I don't, like if I set a right. clear, Hey, look, you have a guideline. My time's just as valuable as your time. And and I'm I'm not because all of a sudden it becomes, you know, I'm just a salesperson if I'm just willing to answer everything at any point and have no structure to our relationship. And then it becomes right. you know, I'm chasing them, they're chasing me. Whereas if we have a professional relationship and it's this is when I respond, this is what you can expect, as long as I hold up to the expectation that I'm setting, they understand they completely understand. Yeah, it, but it's all all in your head thinking like, well, if I don't get back to them, they're gonna call somebody else, and then, uh, you know, no, that that that's the rare case. 
Um, and, and they're probably people you don't want to work with anyway. If, if that's what they think. Right. Right. Um, there's an old story gets bandied about of this businessman's behind a desk and he's meeting with his client and the clients you read, I'm a businessman and the phone rings, rings and rings and rings. And the client says, aren't you going to get that? And the business woman says, the phone exists for my convenience. And at first it looks, it sounds like an arrogant type of story. But the way I think of it is like, oh, the person calling, that's just on their to-do list. Like they're free at 10. They, they had a list, call my financial advisor. So they called. The, not necessarily there being an expectation that you even pick up because you're doing something else. So that's how I translate that. Not so much an arrogant thing, but like, yeah, the phone's there for when I need to call somebody. Yeah, I was talking. Yeah, I feel very much the same way about text messages. Like if, if I'm free at 10, on like a Saturday and I'm like, oh shoot, I have to email Rafe about blah, blah, blah. I'll shoot text like, like, hey, sorry, I didn't get the email over to you. I'll send it tomorrow. My expectation is not that you're going to answer. It's that I'm just sending that out there to you so you know that yeah, you want to cross off your to-do list. And, and, right. Right, right. Yeah, and I think too, like kind of on that same vein, it's like, I learned very on not to make assumptions about why people are reaching, why people are, are calling you, why people are calling you, right? Because the second someone calls you, you go, and you didn't pick up, you go, oh, why is that person calling me? Shoot. And your, your mind immediately goes to the negative, right? Someone right. calls me and asks for an investment statement. The first thing is like, oh, they're giving it to somebody else. And all of a sudden, I'm, you know, they're talking to somebody else. And I'm going to lose them. Right. And most people are like, hey, man, I just want to look at it. And uh, I needed it for, I needed it for my mortgage or whatever it might be. And, but I've created this scenario this, now that this I demand sit with overnight until I then can talk to them. And then, like there's no benefit in, in thinking and making those assumptions, right? Now, right. And I have a generational question. So Zach, you may know, Reed and I do uh, Rafe and the Millennial. He's a millennial. And now Zach, I think you're technically Gen X. Uh, I'm sure he was very confused. I'm sure he's, Zach's yeah, a little I, slow. I wasn't sure which was which. He's a little <laughs> slow, Reed. We got to catch him up on right. things. Right, right. Um, he's, he's probably only the largest producer uh, RMS has ever seen, but he's slow. Yeah, I uh, wish. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pimple on the ass of an elephant here. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I fall in that little sweet spot right between like the millennials and. So this will be interesting. Previous. I get a text message or I don't think anything, you know, I'm like, ah, I'll get to it when I get to it. Like, I'll, I'm really bad. Like, I could be in a text conversation with you, Reed, and then just be done. And you could be like, hello. Like, I just don't respond after a while. I think it's generational because I didn't grow up with it. I'm going to do read first than Zach. Reed, do you, do you think that demand of like, he needs an instant response is because you grew up with that? Um, that, that expectation? I would like, if, if I'm thinking from an urgency standpoint, I would say texts need to be responded before emails Right. Or exactly. Phone. Right. Right. I, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, from a, the quickest, most direct form of communication for me is like a texting for me, texting, I, I grew up, you know, I'm making plans for tonight. I'm making plans with, uh, with my buddies. It was never a business. Uh, There's never a business uh, meaning behind it. Right. So now when I get texts from clients, it comes in, it feels like a text, feels like a buddy's reaching out to me. So it's like this immediate, like, what do you need? That's what I'm getting to is don't you believe when your phone buzzes in your pocket, that's a call for action right then and there to go look at it. You're like, well, my phone buzzed. I got to look at who's reaching out to me. If a client emails me, I take that as they're emailing me. They're asking a question. They're expecting response in 24 hours. If they then for some reason text me, I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay. There's something that they need right away. But I'm saying before that, let's go back to the friend. So like in my generation, I believe, could just be me. I don't know. I, I believe it's generational. My phone buzzes in my pocket. I don't necessarily have any call to action to go pick it up or not. I'm like, oh, somebody texted me. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if your generation is different. If you're like, no, no, that's, we, we're compelled to look. Yeah. I mean, I might not be the most representative millennial there is in the world. No, but... We've already decided you speak for all millennials. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, I generally will respond pretty much immediately unless I was trying to, unless I was trying to court a girl and play cool, but that's no, no, no. I'm talking regular. So like if you and I are having beers and your phone buzzes, you're 
your system of operation would be look at the phone. It's fine. So uh, hold on, Rafe. Hold on. Look at the phone. Uh, with like where you and I are at now, yes. If I was in front of, uh, if I was in front of Zach, like if Zach and I were getting a beer and I didn't know Zach, I wouldn't pull out my phone. Oh, okay. All right. All right, Zach, where do you fall on this? So my hierarchy, I think, is <clears throat> I feel a certain sense of immediacy when it comes to text messages. Emails are a, as quick as I can within reason. Voicemails, I cannot tell you how many times I will call someone. They'd be like, oh, did you listen to the voicemail? No, I just saw you call. Because um, yeah. I can either listen to the voicemail and then call you and have this exact same conversation or I can listen or I can not listen to voicemail I'll call you and have this exact same conversation. <laughs> the thing about voicemail for that drives me, me is, nuts, by the way, as a, as a Gen Xer, I'm like, listen oh, to your God. damn voicemails. No, <laughs> no never going to happen. Here's the reason why this is my thought process behind it. As flawed as this probably is. If you rewind the clock to when you were a kid. Yep. Okay. I love those days. Fr- okay. Your friends didn't call you. Correct. They called a, a place looking for you. Correct. They called the now, house phone. Right. Now people call a person looking for where they are. And mm, that fascinating. That flip, I think for me, ultimately broke voicemail for me entirely. And what? then you combine that with oh, just I'm I'm uh, voicemail. I hate, I hate voicemail. And here's the reason why. I hate voicemail for two reasons. One, I have caller ID. I have you programmed to my phone. I know you called. If it's something urgent, you can text me or email me or all three. It doesn't matter what it is. But I saw you called. That's item number one. Item number two is it is I my love, biggest love, pet peeve. Hey, hey, I just wanted to let you know that it called. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. You called. Right. Yeah. That that's, that's just what, old that's school. what I was gonna say. That's no, no, no. It's not because it happens all the time. Because that's the other the other thing that I hate about voicemail is voicemail is. You know what voicemail is? Voicemail is one of two things. Voicemail is telling me you called and I already know that. Or it's you guessing what I'm doing and it drives me bananas. What are you what like, are you talking about? People use voicemail in a bizarre way in your world. Hey, what, hey Rafe, it's Zach. Uh, you didn't answer, so I'm, I, I guess you're with a client um, or I guess you're oh. taking the day off huh. or I guess you're on vacation or I guess you're mowing the lawn or I guess, like, I don't need you to guess. Like I saw you call, it drives me nuts. Text message, Rafe, call me. All right. I can look at it in a second, all the information I need, and I get the jingle. Instead of this like long-winded, that, and the other thing too is like, dude, if your voicemail is more than 13 seconds long, you've, you've, you've lost me. Oh my gosh. I have so much to say wait, on this. Reed, last, you go first. Wait, when's the last time you got a voicemail that had really valuable information? In it? Me? Yeah. Never, because the world's been taken over by you millennials and edge because millennials. if anybody has anything really important, it's call me back. I need to talk to you. It's not, they're not going to sit there and tell you. Drive exactly. me nuts. It, let me, let me. Let me share with you, Gen X. First of all, all those uses of, of voicemail, I concur with you. And how many, times, how many times have you called someone, left a voicemail? Actually, you know what? You do this. You do this. Shoot, I, oh, I, here I, we go. Here we go. He does this. He'll call and he'll go, hey, Reed, no need to call me back. I just, had a, I just had a thought. Wanted to share it with you. Don't worry. Don't ruin your weekend. Don't bother calling me back. Like, he literally will leave messages just to sort of tell a short story and then be like, okay, like, it's a very gen- it's actually a very genuine thing and it's it's like one of those things like when you get a handwritten letter in the mail you're like huh yeah not- here's how i view voicemail like yeah. zach like i'm doing business with zach right now he's doing my mortgage uh and i might be here's how i look at it right before you can you can have me beat with i'm about to say with voice dictation but before voice dictation me the gen xer is like i'm so damn slow texting I have fat thumbs. It takes freaking forever. And I'm not at my computer. So I want to be able to say to Zach, hey, Zach, got your message about the appraiser. I got your email about the appraiser and uh, I'm on top of it. He doesn't have to call me back. There's no action, but he has information. It's just like an email, except I didn't have to be at a computer and I didn't have to type it. And it's just like a text, except I think it's even more courteous as a text because I know all you guys don't listen to your voicemails. I shouldn't say that. I know you guys aren't compelled to answer a voicemail and so i'm not texting you making your phone buzz up my counterpoint to that would be as follows every time you leave me a voicemail it takes up a certain amount of space in my voicemail queue yep if you send me a text message it takes up no space because i glance at it it's marked as red and it's gone my problem is 
Like for instance, yesterday I went through. Wait, yesterday. wait! Before you do that, can't you say that is efficient? I, rather, I, would well, I take it back. It's not efficient because you guys hate voicemail. But if yes. you were to just, if you could just see it from the point of just efficiency, it's not efficient because you guys don't like it. But you see what I'm saying? It's just as no. efficient as an email. No. How is how is it not? Okay. So right now I'm looking at my email and I have an email from a woman named Carrie S. Not my wife. It just happens to be the same first name and last name. Oh, initial. sure. Okay. Such and such file is clear to close. All set. Final closing disclosure should be out later today. Yep. Awesome. That could be in a voicemail. Yeah. How? Okay. Now I got to log in. I got to listen. And while, and I can't listen to that while I'm on here with you. And I can't listen to it while I'm driving because I got to fumble with my phone. Instead, it's just a quick glance. Like, and if I forgot I would. If I forgot to I forgot what you said, I could then, then go listen to it again. I'd rather be able to pick up my phone and go, oh yeah, that's exactly what it said. Okay, good. I can roll with that. Or or as an add-on to what Rita's saying, how about this? Hey Rafe, it's Zach. Give me a call back. My number is six oh three seven seven zero eight one eight. Now you listen to it twelve freaking times. What? Now you're versus six oh three seven seven zero eight one one eight. Just text me, hey Rafe, it's Zach. Call me when you can. I would argue that that's wildly more. Yeah, th those types. Of, I'm talking about information giving, but yeah, it's funny. I do, I do think of that. Like when I was a young man, making my bones in the world, it was it was phone calls and voicemails. And when I had to ask a girl I on a, a date, I had to talk to her dad on the phone. I had a guy call me, and then he texts me. He goes, "Hey, just gave you a call." He goes, "By the way, your voicemail's full." <laughs> like, I can't have like. I often just hang up now. My profession, I can't have my voicemail full, but I don't ever know. I've only, probably only got 20 voicemails in there. 90% yeah. of the Here, fans. Here's what drives me nuts on the phone. Because they're side. all eight minutes long guessing what you're doing. Yeah, right. here's what gets me nuts. <laughs> I give Zach 12 pieces of information in the voicemail that he then doesn't yep. listen to. But I forget that he's not going to listen to it. And then he right. calls me and goes, hey, what's up? And I'm like, listen to the voicemail? No. And now I'm like, now I'm repeating myself. So. Mm -hmm. It's funny. It's a it's an interesting disconnect. It's not going to matter because us Gen Xers are soon going to be, you know, will be the baby boomers and retire. But it is funny. But it's it's a conditioning thing. If I ignore your voicemail long enough, eventually you'll have you are to correct. Text me if I remember. Like now, I'll remember and I'll remember for read. I'll just hang up. Like I'll call. I'll be like, oh, what am I doing? And then I'll hang up. But I would also argue, you take it one step further. Let's say you send me an email, just email or text message, either one. Let's say in 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 some in some typed medium, you send me your list of 12 questions. If they're quick answers, and I know that you like talking on the phone, I can call you and review that as I'm going through it. Whereas if it's in a voicemail, I can't listen to the voicemail while I'm talking to you. So again, yeah, I, what I like that it's more efficient. What I like about the phone is not so much that I like talking phone or even that's how I'm used to doing business. It's more, I find it to be more versatile because I'm not chained to my desk. Now again, mm -hmm. my argument is a lot weakened now with voice dictation because it can act like a phone for me, which is I get to talk to relay my information to you. So now it's almost moot to me, voicemail, because I can talk my information. I don't want to have to type. That's even, that's even a little weird to me. Voice dictation? Yeah. I mean, the voice dictation, like I'm kind of coming around it a little bit, but like texting, I don't think I've ever used voice dictation to text. Oh my God. Why yeah. use your fingers? You guys are just good it at it. Takes, it takes it takes a half a second. Well, somehow you were good at it. Like you're born with it in your crib. So not to go wildly off topic, but I'm gonna go wildly off topic for a second. So I was reading this really interesting thing the other day about how my generation, so like the generation born like like 75 to 85, like somewhere in that range, whatever generation or generations that is, we're the first generation that by and large is more dexterous with our thumbs than with our index fingers. Oh yeah, oh, because, no doubt. because we grew up with video games and then texting and all that stuff. And it's like, it, it's funny because if you watch like my mother text messages like with her index finger typing, mm -hmm. like one hand holding the phone this, and you look at everybody else and it's like and it's just, it's funny to watch because it's kind of an interesting one. Yeah, and then my me and my wife's generation, we have our font that's like our text messages are this big. Like the table next to us is reading our private conversation, <laughs> right. and we're just fat thumbing everything and cursing. Well, but that's a great point, Zach. It's like even like uh, like if I'm just sitting there on my phone, like I'm just scrolling like this. Yeah, and I look at my mom. She's like scrolling with her finger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, 
Here's what's interesting. Have you seen? So I have a 19 year old and a 20 and a oh geez, she 21 now. I can't remember 20, 19, 20, and um, their generation types with their two fingers on a desk. So their phones like on the counter and they're going like that. Have you seen my that? cousin? My my cousin did that the first time I had seen that like. like um, this sounds like such an old person to say. First time I saw that in real life, but uh, my sister got married two summers ago, and when my cousins were up from Florida, they did the same thing where it was down on the desk and they were like typing like maniacs like this. And I'm like, why don't you just like? No, they're no. I wonder. I don't know what that is. Here's something else. Read, and I can't wait. Zach, is your son using a control? How old is he? Four. Yeah. Is he using a mouse yeah, or a control controller? He is really good on the touch screen on like an iPad, and he's getting better at the xbox one controller yeah here's what's amazing to me reed if you handed your baby an ipad i guarantee you when she's old enough she will know how to operate it and like how is that possible like i can remember again my generation with a mouse we didn't have mice we had it was key commands when we first had a mouse you should have seen that arrow flying all over the place it was i felt like i was doing brain surgery trying to get the arrow to go where I needed it to go. And, but you give a, a mouse to a kid, they're like, zing, 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 zing. How? I know, but it's remarkable watching a four-year-old correct an adult on how to properly execute something on an iPad. It's just, no, no, no Grammy. You do it like this. He's navigating menus. Like, I don't know how he does it. Like, it's even like, I mean, I'm only, I'm not 40 yet, but I'm close. But, you know, I'll look at something. It takes me a little while to figure out. And he's just in there doing his thing. I mean, it's just... I'm sure my parents felt the same way about us with like a Nintendo back in like the early eighties, but I have an opinion that, that 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 gap is going to not be so drastic. Like, if, like for my parents now, like the concept of new technology is just like, Nope, not dealing with it. Don't get it. Not like it, they get so frustrated. I think for us, it's, it's so woven into everything we do that staying up with a lot of the technologies are like, for me, like when my, when my parents had to switch from VHS to DVD, like nightmare scenario. Yep. Now everything past VHS, you know, shifting to a smart TV, shifting to the fire sticks, Google Chromecast, whatever it is, like it's, it's such an undertaking. And I'm like, it's four buttons and it's such an unwillingness <laughs> to even learn. But I feel so like funny. with our oh. upcoming generation, like we, I think we're gonna. I would assume we're gonna stay with it because I, I have the same yeah. theory about music too. Like, in, like my parents are stuck in like they either listen to you know the seventies, eighties music or they listen to like yacht rock, but they never they don't they never stuck with like okay we're gonna keep just moving on. Whereas I think because of like Spotify and it's so ingrained in our lives and and that the that media and the information is so at our fingertips that we will be better at sticking with. Sort that's of brilliant, actually. I, I, that's what I assume is going to happen. I could be very wrong. That's really interesting to think about, though. You're, you're right. It, like, if you imagine, like, my grandparents' generation, you know, like, my grandfather said one time before he passed away that, like, in his lifetime, he went from cutting blocks of ice out of a lake so they could keep things cool to the summer to watching a man walk on the moon. Yes. And, like, like that level of progression in a lifetime is kind of crazy. Now you look at where, where we are and it feels very much, and I could be wildly off base here, but it feels very much like everything now is kind of building on the previous iteration instead of being this whole new thing. And to your point, I think you might be right. Like, it's kind of funny to think about. Well, because like, we have information. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, like the idea of going from, you know, cutting blocks of ice to the moon, like they weren't watching the steps of how the moon landing happened. Right. Like how they set up the screen screen, how the CGI worked, like things like that. So, uh, but they, like, you don't, you never saw that progression where now it's like, we see in real time, you literally any news story, anytime you look at mm -hmm. that progression happen in real time. So it doesn't seem like this, you know, for the, a stupid pun, like this huge giant leap for man. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I think you guys are not going to resist technology. Correct me if I'm wrong until it becomes like a biochip. So like if your kids are like 13 and it becomes a way to embed a chip in their bodies to do something technological, whether it's their wallet or it opens their phones or something, 
they'll be like, oh, yeah, whatever, chip. But you guys will be like, what the? Eh, I'm not putting a chip. I think. Could be wrong. I don't know the answer to that. I would like to, I, I could see it going the other way where, you know, people just get so fed up with big data and the concept of oh. chip. Like, you know, what's that? Uh, like, if you can't see the product, you're the one being sold. Like, you're the product. Right. Like, right. Like, I think people are starting to get really annoyed with that. I and see. Trying to take a stand. So, like, yeah, if they're putting something in my body that might make me more effective on a day to day, but then I also know everything's getting sold to everybody else. Like, I can see there's probably, there would be a large contingent that would be. But I don't know. In my, in my lifetime, I've seen all these advances make my life a whole lot easier and it's going to get really hard for me to just say no to something and sort of fall by the wayside a little bit. I think um, we'll wrap this up pretty soon too. Uh, it's a great conversation. I loved it. Um, I told Zach this last podcast, like for me, my, you know, I was 13. It was the Apple II and it existed mm-hmm. in the library of your school and there was one, you didn't have one in your house till maybe 18. And now we have our cell phones, which are in essence to me, a Star Trek communicator. You know, so for what I saw on TV as a science fiction gadget exists in real life. And I'm always amazed that people aren't amazed. Like, I'm like, we have a Star Trek community. We literally, not even the, not even the communicator that, that Kirk could do. We have the ship's computer in our phones. Like that to me is just such a marvel, but we don't even, we as a people don't even really marvel at it. It's like, oh, but of course. Which, which is crazy to think about. Like, if you think about like how advanced a smartphone really is. Right. Like, our heads should be exploding every time we hold one. And everybody's yes. just like, yeah, it's just this thing that I have. And every two years, Apple tells me it's broken. So I get a new one. And then right. we're it's just right. like, 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 but you're, but you're right. I mean, like if you could travel back to like, imagine being able to travel back to even just like, like 1975, let's just go back that long. So slightly before I was born, rape was probably 40 at the time. Um, That's right. You know, you know, go, go back. But I if was you went six. back there and you were like, and you were like, in this device is my calendar electronic mail that you haven't even heard of yet yeah it has a camera i can take videos i can upload them directly and anyone in the world can see them in real time basically and in addition to that every song i've ever really cared about is in here and if i find a song that i don't know that i love i click one button it scans my face to make sure i'm me and then that song shows up in this thing that I can use for the rest of my life. Like, and it's practically people, free. People would throw themselves off of rooftops. Yes. And we're just like, oh man, my iPhone's going slightly slower than it was yesterday. Time to get a new one. Like, it's just, that's crazy to me. Me too. Well, there's that argument that like, you know, everyone's worried like, well, are we going to start getting things implanted? Are we going to become, you know, quote unquote cyborgs? Like there's an argument that like we already are. Like we I have- already are. I have the information in my hand almost a hundred percent of the time I'm awake. Yes. Right. If I need any answer, I can access it in less than 10 seconds. So, like, so we have this game that we play in the office here where somebody will ask a question and you're not allowed to Google it. Like you, you have, you have to find the answer on your own. Like you can't go online. You can't do anything else. You have to ask people, talk to people, like whatever else in, in formulate. And then we have like a race to see who can come up with the answer first. And it's so funny to watch because you can actually see the generational gap within the office of like the older people. And then the really young people and the kind of the shades of gray in the middle of like, on the one end it is, how, how would I ever possibly be able to do that? And then on the other end, it's all right. If I think about this enough, I can probably figure it out. But like that's the other sort of like weird, like cause and effect thing of, because you have all the information so readily available is like, you almost kind of gave up on trying to solve problems yourself. Now you just the other side of the argument that you've then freed up space for other things that, cause like, I don't need to know what nine plus nine times nine is. 81. I don't need to, I don't need to keep that here. Cause I've got it here. I know what nine does nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it now frees up space, brain space for me that, you know, keep something else that I really care about in my head. Right. But um, you do, do you lose, you know, problem solving and critical thinking? Uh, that's an interesting argument too. Might be a good podcast technology, which is after every innovation that's supposed to save us time, we don't, we just fill it up with more time. I mean, I'm sorry. We fill it up with more tasks. So the washing machine was supposed to save time. 
and we just, you know, soccer moms just jam their calendars full with soccer practice. All right, I'm going to bring it full circle because Zach brought it there with fun. So we started this podcast with fun, and he just said something I thought was fun, and our listeners, and I might want this challenge. Can you, can you give Reed and I and the listeners something to answer that, and you too, I don't know if it works for you too, but that we don't look up and we'll try to answer next episode. Ooh. Um, so for us, it's always like silly things like, um, was Val Kilmer in the movie Willow? Okay. So like something silly like that. So I don't have like a really great example off the top of my head, but I can't use the internet. No, no internet. You have to, you have to figure out why. And then you have to be able to properly explain. This gets back to like the fourth grade, like show your work on the math problem. You have to be able to explain as best you can the thought progression that went through it. That does, even for me, in Gen Xers seems like an impossible task because if I just talk to 12 people and they don't know, then that's the end of that. It is, but you may talk to somebody and go, I think so, because wasn't he playing the guy of, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can say, no, he wasn't the bad guy. I think he was one of the good guys, and it's who I'm thinking. It just, it gets you there. It's like, oh. how do you track your journey? I'm out. I literally, I'm out. Everybody who I talk to is going to be, have... Yeah. Do you have another one? I wasn't supposed to be more stressed out at the end of this podcast. Now I'm all stressed out. No, 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 no. I just gave you another egg to carry. Um, yeah. Let me see. Yeah, no, I mean, like a lot, a lot of them are like just they're they're all like really silly and they're kind of like situational. Like somebody will bring something oh, up. Oh, situational. Just okay. like, gotcha. Yeah. So it's just it's like next time somebody asks you a question that you don't know the answer to right away, just think about it and try to Google it right away, unless it's obviously like pressing. Huh. All right. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for sh showing up Zach and Reed. And, uh, we've got another one booked for two weeks out and, Oh, Reed, I saved hey, the topic that you brought up, Zach. It's a, it's a BNI networking topic on oh, what uh, is it? best practices for the referrals. We're talking about how to do the, the two way text read. I don't like referrals. <laughs> you don't like yes, you referrals. do. No, no, no. I like introductions. I don't like referrals. That's what I want to talk about. There we go. Hold on. No, you like introductions, but you don't like referrals. Yeah. In my mind, they're two different things. All right, let's save it. Well, yeah, the, save it for oh, that. I, That's a good I, topic. Now I really want, but now I really want to talk about this. No, we have to wait. No, gotta wait. I'm gonna write that down. I don't like <laughs> referrals. <laughs> referrals is a dirty word. Referrals. I like introductions. Okay. Until next time. Okay. See you, gentlemen. All right. Oh, and find a mortgage person. No. Like, that's the rare case when someone calls you up and goes, hey, man, I'm thinking about buying a house. I actually probably need to talk about a mortgage. It's usually like one of their friends being like, oh, you should talk to this guy or, or, or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the, the I, to me, like, it's, it's just... I'm listening. I, I got to close the door. I am listening. Though. So it just, to me, it's shifted into like the referral idea is, is, Hey, I gave them your name. They, they should be giving you a call. And so I think like, I, 90% like of my business is, and I think a lot of us is 90% of it is like, I need an introductory text, email, phone call that says, Hey, met with so-and-so I don't know if you guys have anything to like in common, but it's worth your time to me. Worth your time to have a conversation, not just like, Hey, Johnny, meet so-and-so. Hey. Uh, okay. See you later. Like, like tee it, like people need to tee it up better to warm it up and make it seem like it's worth each other's time to just have a conversation. Would argue that in that exact description you just gave, you are explaining the difference between well, that. Would be my my counterpoint to that is, you know, so for example, you know, in your example there about somebody who needs financing, you know, you say, you know, hey, I need to buy a house. I got to find a mortgage person. Nope. Okay. Hey, Bob, my next door neighbor said, hey, I had a good experience with so and so. You should give them a call. You know, that I think you can make the argument that that is a lead. 
that you weren't given that was a lead to them i mean i think that's where you kind of get into this like kind of fundamental difference between like leads and referrals to to your point you know if i said hey reed i was talking to my next door neighbor he just got a raise at work um he probably should be investing call him that that's a lead that's that's you having to do the work to acquire the business versus me saying, Bob, I know you got that raise. It's awesome. I know you're trying to figure out how to save for college for Susie because we had a conversation about it yesterday at the barbecue. I was thinking my buddy Reed mentioned something a few weeks ago at a get together we were at about college planning, saving and some strategies that he's implementing for one of our other clients. Do you mind if I have him give you a call? That would be a referral because now when you call him, he knows who you are. He knows that you're specializing in something he already needs. He knows that you're going to solve a problem for him and you both know who each other are. Maybe not face to face, but that would be, I think, the fundamental difference.